Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We're teaching on ministry in the Spirit. And over these programs, we've been looking at all the different ways that the Holy Spirit will use you to minister to other people. Because as a disciple of Jesus Christ, you want to follow in his footsteps to become a servant, a minister, one who takes care of other people. We've seen how God will use you to pray for people who need healing, people who need deliverance. But there is another important area of ministry, and that is speaking words into people's lives of guidance and direction. We could call this counseling. The counseling ministry is a very important part of ministry in the Spirit because as fellow members of the family of God, as people who love and serve Jesus together, we are called to encourage one another, to counsel one another, to build one another up. And I believe that this teaching will help you become more equipped to speak positive words of encouragement to other people. Jesus didn't just preach the gospel, cast out demons, heal the sick. He did those things, but he also spent a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with people, giving them words of direction and hope, and it's a wonderful ministry to enjoy. God bless you as we pick up on this teaching, the Ministry of Counseling. Hello and welcome to this last session on Ministry in the Spirit, part of the Sword of the Spirit series, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Throughout this series, I've been teaching you out of the Word of God, how you've been called to be a servant of the Lord, to minister to other people the way Jesus ministered, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life, with His gifts operating in you. And we've looked at the range of ministries that are available and the things that we need to do to lay hands on the sick to see them recover, cast out demons in Jesus' name, speak powerfully over people's lives to see God's blessing come and the prosperity and abundance of the Holy Spirit to minister to them. Now we're going to close this teaching series with a session on the ministry of counseling. And uh, it's something we cannot neglect because we've emphasized things like healing and deliverance and releasing people from curse-like pronouncements, and yet a lot of people need something different. It's not enough just to lay hands on people. It's not enough just to pray some prayer over them. They need to be instructed from the Word of God. They need to be counseled and blessed and directed and advised out of the Scriptures in a spirit of wisdom and understanding. And this is as much part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit as everything else that I've been talking to you about. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that this is the end of the ministry model that I presented to you in one of the earlier sessions. We're really talking about the hold on period after some other kind of ministry, then we still need to continue to disciple people. And so we started, of course, with the hands up, that's dependence, Hands off, that is discernment, and hands on, that's demonstration, that's the ministry time, and then hold on as we move into discipleship. And so counseling is very much part of the discipleship process. We see that Jesus, not only did he heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons, but he also counseled people. He spoke, he taught, he encouraged. He was and is the true wonderful counselor of Isaiah chapter 9. Now, although counseling is an important part of the ministry of the Spirit, it is different from some of the other ministries we've been looking at. For example, healing, deliverance, and blessing aim to meet people's needs for them. You understand what I'm saying? So when somebody needs healing, you pray that they might be healed they are just receiving something that is happening to them, 
They need to be involved, they need to be active in it, they need to be full of faith and so forth. But counseling differs because passing on God's advice gives them a course of action, something that they must follow for themselves. It's not just, of course, passing on advice, it's encouraging people, and speaking and teaching them, instructing them, exhorting them, but also it will include, if we are receiving these words from the Lord, it will be giving them direction according to the revelation of God's word. Healing and deliverance bring about immediate transformation, whereas counseling establishes a much more long-term change pattern in the person's life. Now, some people suppose that uh, counseling happens whenever people give advice, but genuine counseling in the Bible is uh, more than that. It can happen when we're simply talking informally. We call it kitchen counseling, maybe, or sitting down over a cup of coffee or something and sharing uh, the word of the Lord. It doesn't have to have these great pictures of formal, structured, clinical type of counseling. But it's part and parcel of the aftercare we give to people when we minister to them, and part and parcel of our responsibility to help nurture, teach, admonish, and disciple one another. And it's helping them take the next step in their spiritual journey. That's what counseling really is. And so, it quite simply, counseling is discipling a person, helping them learn about Jesus and learn from Christ and to follow his example in their lives. In other words, it's a ministry of helps, helping people in their lives in that way. Now, we need to see that counseling has a very special spiritual dimension. In other words, this is an activity of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, again, it was the prophets who were the counselors, those who were gifted by God's Spirit to speak words of wisdom and direction and revelation to people. And so we again see yet once more that the ministry God's called us to is very especially a kind of prophetic ministry because when we counsel people, we are giving them God's wisdom. Prophets were called to speak God's word and a, a counseling word is, is a prophetic word of wisdom. Again, let me emphasize, I'm not saying that we are therefore all of us prophets, but we have this prophetic dimension to our lives. We need to distinguish between counseling and giving advice. Let me just make this point here. Good advice is very different from God's counsel. Good advice, we're not just talking about good advice. It's not just talking about good common sense advice, although please do that as well. It's important to do that. But when we're talking about counseling, we are now really talking about ministering the word of the Lord to people. Counseling is very much like preaching one-on-one. -on -one. It's taking the Word of God and applying the Word of God to a person's life in the situation as it's needed and as it's presented. Now, there are, there's this Greek word for uh, will, God's counsel, is boule, boule, God's counsel. It means a declaration of the will of God. Then there's another word, nome, in the Greek, which means advice. Now, this refers to opinion based on reason, based on experience, based on knowledge. And so normally, when we speak about nome or advice, we're talking about, well, in my experience, I've, I've found that. And, and there, it's good. There's a lot of wisdom in this. But also, we need the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So the clear declaration of God in Scripture, which is boule, can also be supplemented and illustrated and help, helpfully augmented by God's revelation to us, his revelation knowledge, which can also be nome. Now, Paul spoke nome words in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 25, uh, and uh, also in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, 37, he declared boule. So Paul did both. Bule is God's clear scriptural revelation word, but nome was Paul's advice, and as an apostle, 
you know, that advice could be just as anointed as anything else. And in fact, when Paul spoke his apostolic advice, he was carrying very often a prophetic anointing, so strong that the word of the apostle was to be treated as the word of God, and eventually it did become part of Scripture, much of it. So what this tells us is that we should distinguish when we are counseling people we should distinguish between the Scriptures, which is God's infallible Word, and they must obey it, and then also distinguish things which are perhaps more like advice. And you can't speak with the same authority, otherwise you will end up giving them advice which you think they should receive directly from God, and it's not. You must judge your advice, and they must judge your advice from the Scriptures. But when your advice lines up with the Scriptures, then it's an authoritative word. Or when that advice comes from the revelation of the Holy Spirit and matches the Scriptures, then it's a strong word also for, for that person. And so this makes us realize that when we speak to people, we must be very careful to what, what authority we allow them to ta attach to our words. Very wrong to speak out of turn. And this is what can happen. Some people feel, well, what right have I got to tell anybody else what to do? Well, you have no right at all. But you have a responsibility to call them to do what the Word of God says. And so that's what the counseling ministry is. Now, in order to do this, of course, we see, we're going to have to ask God. We're going to have to come before Him and say, Lord, I want to give people not just my advice, but I want them to, I want to give these people your Word, your advice. And uh, this is what happened to a man called Ahothophel in the Old Testament. Ahithophel, Ahithophel, very difficult name. You need counseling after trying to say that name. And this is the advice of this fellow, which he gave in those days, which was as if one had inquired at the oracle of God. So was the advice of Ahithophel. This man, this wonderful brother, <laughs> both with David and Absalom. And so we need to seek God uh, that uh, when, we, when we minister counseling and when we counsel people, that we're not just giving them our ideas, but we're giving them God's heart, God's will, and God's mind. So in this, be careful not to obscure God's will. Be very careful. Because if we start meddling into other people's lives and we start giving them our own opinions, and, 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 and just believe me, there's so much of this happens in the body of Christ. It seems that the body of Christ is riddled with busybodies. Riddled with busybodies. And they give advice. It's as if that they've been influenced by the popular chat shows and discussion panels of the day where people get together and pool their ignorance and everybody's opinion is mm, mm, all mashed in together and it's a terrible mess. And this idea, well, everybody has an opinion. He should go out with that girl, he shouldn't go out with that girl. This, that, and the other, and so forth. And this is not counseling. This is busybodying. This is meddling. And, and it's, it's not of God. And there is a rebuke for this. Job 32, 38 and verse 2. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? It's a very, very awesome thing to speak into somebody's life. And you had better make sure that you know the Bible. You better make sure that you know the Word of God. You better make sure how, that you know how to speak to them in such a way that the Word of God becomes clear to them. Even if we, pro if we prophesy in part, as Paul says, how much more should we be careful about what we say as we, as we counsel people? And often a holy hesitation is what's called for. I think this is what God is suggesting. Let's examine this as a, a possible solution to the problem. Let's see what God says about this from his word. Let's, let's tackle uh, God's word on, on this particular issue. And let's see how this issue is tackled in God's Word. Now, when a scripture relates directly to a person's situation, you don't need to hesitate if it's so clear. I mean, for example, adultery is wrong. You don't have to say, well, let's, let's just examine this for a while and see what, what the Lord would have us have to say. Well, the point is, quite simply, it's clearly 
spelled out in the Word of God. Sin is sin, my friends, and we cannot hide that fact. But there are times in which there are, there are going to be complex issues in people's lives, and we must tread very, very carefully. Okay, we also must remember that God's counsel can be rejected. John the Baptist, who had a most powerful ministry preparing for the way of the Lord, was rejected by many of the Pharisees. And throughout the Bible, just because there's good advice and it's coming from God, doesn't mean to say people obey it. So advice that uh, you are giving, even from the Lord, can be rejected. And that must be a freedom that you allow, because we are not here to control people's lives. They are responsible, ultimately, between themselves and before God. But as far as we're concerned, our responsibility is to point them in the right way, show them the consequences of their actions, and pers help persuade them. But at the end of the day, it's their decision. And if they t choose to disobey God, they will have to pay the consequences. Okay. And if your advice is rejected, don't become depressed. Uh, this happened to that man with the unpronounceable name for today. <laughs> it happened to him. And uh, he went out and hung himself. Well, it was a very, very extreme case. But at the end of the day, your responsibility is to be true to the Word of God, true to the Bible, true to the Holy Spirit, true to what God is showing you, and you leave the results with Him. Make sure you don't add any extra thoughts of your own. Now, in Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is the one who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. who stands not in the path of the wicked, right? Now, what am I talking about? The counsel of the ungodly. The Bible has the answers for life and living, my friend. You don't need to go to those popular self-help books that you find in those cheap ends of the bookstores. And you will find, you will find in the self-help sections all kinds of spurious advice it all has to be judged by the Word of God. Now, some of the things that, that, that people say are very good, but if it's not Bible, it's not godly counsel. If it's against the Bible, it's not godly counsel. And so, we have no right to add to the Word of God the ideas and opinions of men. It doesn't matter what professor, what psychologist, what psychiatrist, what counselor says it, if it's not the Bible, we should not touch it. Now, I don't have time in this short session to teach you in detail about the relationship between psychology and the Bible. But let me just say one or two things. When something has been discovered by psychologists, which, are of, which is of value to human beings, that is a gift of God. We call it common grace. And what we need to do is to see if that insight lines up with the Bible. If the insight lines up with the Bible, then it becomes something which we can use. But if it's against the Bible, it doesn't matter how popular it is, or how much the uh, professional people swear by it, we must stick to the Word of God and, and the principles of the Word of God. And so remember that some people are going to counselors, and they're being given all kinds of unbiblical, ungodly advice. Well, if your marriage relationship is not suiting you, then divorce. Or, you, well, you are obviously you're homosexual, so the only best thing you can do is to accept that you're homosexual and then live like that and, and, and so forth. That's what they're being given in the name of science and in the name of, uh, of objective advice and objective help. Uh, from uh, many of these secularists. But at the end of the day, if it is not the Word of God, we have no right to pass it on to other people and to minister it to other people's lives. With this, we must have the boldness and confidence not to draw back. The Apostle Paul said, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Acts chapter 20 and verse 27. And uh, the word there is hupostello, and that's a nautical Greek verb, hupostello, which means literally to lower a sail, and it's best translated as slackening or drawing back. And there is that reticence in all of us. Well, 
that, that we feel at a certain point, I mean, I certainly find that I think, my, to, to walk into this situation where there's complexity, where there's sin in, involved, how can we really get in there and speak God's truth to these people? There is a sense in which there's a temptation to draw back and not to speak the truth in love, but to hold back. But if you really love, you will speak the truth. Yes, you will. You will speak the truth. If your brother is overtaken by a fault, you will restore your brother. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. You will do it because you are your brother's keeper. You will not draw back from giving them God's truth in the situation. But also, Galatians 6, 1 goes on to say, you must do this in a spirit of gentleness, watching yourself, lest you also be tempted. The one that you are counseling today may be the one who will be counseling you tomorrow. So remember, in fear and trembling, never, never draw back. Also, make it clear, make it very, very clear, the whole point about counseling is to take the Word of God and make it clear to the person as to how it fits their situation, so they will know the what, the why, and the how. They need to know what they're doing that they shouldn't be doing, and what they should be doing about it, why they should be doing it, because it's not just a question of telling people what to do. There's the why. The why speaks of motivation. The motivation for this is to love the Lord Jesus Christ. So, for example, if you've got a husband and wife coming before you there, and the, well, maybe, maybe, maybe some of the husband's coming for counseling, uh, and the husband says, you know, it is absolutely terrible. I'm, I'm ready to leave my wife. It's, it's, it's awful. And um, so you begin to counsel the person, and you find that the person then realizes that there is, a, there is some hope for their marriage. Okay, the, the reason that they should start obeying God is to obey God, not even to save their marriage. Did you know that? If they make it their goal in counseling that I'm going to save my marriage, that's the goal, then they have fallen short of what God's goal is, which to, is to glorify God by the saving of the marriage. So we don't change just to get out of a tight spot. You understand that? We change because God tells us to. We change because we are living for Jesus Christ. That's the motivation. But there's also a how-to involved. How-to. And that's what counseling is all about. Practically showing people how to deal with that addiction. How to put that marriage straight. How to deal with this compulsive lying that's taking place. How to be more faithful in this area or that area. It's practical application of the Word of God into a person's situation. Also notice that there will be varied consequences. Sometimes there will be uh, positive results, and we, as we pass on God's wisdom to people, we would really hope that there would be some, but other times that there won't be, and um, it's just a question of uh, uh, speaking to people in a way which sows seeds for the future. All right. Now we're going to move on to have a look at the divine counselor. Who is that? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Counseling is not something that we engage in independent of God. Now the secular counselors have done this. And I think very largely the counseling boom that there was in the 1970s, 80s, and through into the 1990s, the counseling boom that there is out there in the world, a lot of it is because Christians have failed to counsel the way God has called them to counsel, and the world has stepped in and filled in the gap. We've got to get back to godly, biblical counseling. It's all part of our call to disciple one another and to minister to one another. And when we do that, we are doing it in God, by God. It's godly counsel, not the counsel of the ungodly. All right, it's a God-initiated and a God-shared task. So this means we should look at the Scriptures to examine God's counseling activities and learn about the work of counseling. Let's begin with God the Father. God the Father is the great, great counselor. Isaiah 28, verse 29 this also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. God the Father 
is a wise and wonderful counselor. And you just need to read the Bible sometimes with that in mind. Watch the way God deals with people. And when you, the way you see God dealing with people, that's the way a counselor should work. Not that a counselor stands in the place of God. No, I'm not, I'm not implying that. What I'm saying is this, that when you see God counsel people, you have an example of what good counseling really is. Look how he counsels David, Daniel. Look how he counsels Elijah. Elijah, the depressive former prophet who is just handed in his resignation. How does God handle him? God, first of all, acknowledges that he's physically burnt out. So he sends an angel to bake him a cake. This is the original angel cake. And uh, he eats that and he goes in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights. Don't forget that sometimes people's emotional problem is linked to their physical condition. We're not just body people, we are body soul people. Not even just body soul people, we're body soul spirit people. Sometimes people's depression and emotional state can be the result of a physical problem in their bodies. And I reckon Elijah was pretty exhausted physically. I, I would like to know what the vitamins were that went into that cake that kept him like that for those 40 days. And then God spoke to him very, very personally. He said, you, you've begun to, you begin to misunderstand things. You're looking at the spectacular. And all of this flows out of the still small voice. Don't look at the spectacular, Elijah. I'm not in the earthquake, I'm not in the wind, I'm not in the fire. I'm in the still, small voice. You've lost intimacy with me. You've focused on your ministry. You've forgotten me. You've so burnt yourself out in working for me that intimacy with me is lost. And he restores that. Can you see it? Look at uh, how God deals with people. You can take practically any example from the Bible to see how God deals with people. That's the Father, wonderful person that he is. And that brings today's teaching on ministry in the Spirit to a close. I pray that over these programs, God has begun to show you what it means to minister for Him, to be a true servant of Jesus Christ, and to do so in the power and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Till next time, God bless you.